Hi, I'm Elliot Chu. I'm the Interim Dean for the College of Science. I'm J.P. Jones, and I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. The two colleges are really excited to bring this lecture series to you. This lecture series is centered on the COVID-19 pandemic, both the past, present, and future of where this pandemic is leaving us. The two colleges are really excited to bring you fresh perspectives that emerge from combining the insights of both social science and scientific scholars. This pandemic has wrecked havoc on global health, economies, exposed systematic inequalities, disrupted family and personal relationships, and frankly, disrupted our understanding of time and place. This pandemic is gonna have an enormous impact on every aspect of our daily lives. So we've decided to create three conversations. The first conversation will be between a geneticist and a historian, and they're going to discuss the pathways that pandemics have taken throughout history and how this one is impacting our lives. The second lecture will be between um, a compassion expert and an audiologist. And they're gonna be talking about both empathy and compassion and how that can help us get through this amazingly difficult time. And the third conversation will be between a biologist and a communications expert who are gonna talk about how human perception and behavior can help fight this pandemic. And this program will be hosted and moderated by Nancy Montoya, an award-winning journalist and reporter with the UA Marketing and Communications team. Nancy's worked with PBS, CNN, NBC, AZPM, and she's an SBS graduate of the School of Journalism. Thank you, Nancy, for doing this for us. And thank also Mike and Beth Kasser and Holula Companies for their financial support. Thank you, JP. We're really excited that both of our colleges can partner to bring you this conversation. I hope it's informative and also very much helpful during this very challenging time. Welcome to the second in a series of three conversations that may just help all of us cope a little better with the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Nancy Montoya from the University of Arizona's Communications Department. I'm joined today by Leslie Langbert, the Director of the Center for Compassion Studies. Welcome, Leslie. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. And by Nicole Moroni, an associate professor in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Nancy. Now, the two of you come from what might appear to be two different uh, playing fields. Um, but in actuality, there's a lot that both of you have in common. First of all, uh, to you, Leslie, tell us a little bit about the work you do. Yeah, and the Center for Compassion Studies, our work really centers around investigating the impact of expanding and cultivating compassion on our own individual well-being and the well-being of um, society and its impact on the environment. And we are really heavily invested in sharing compassion practices, skills, and tools to help develop this really important trait and skill. And how about you, Nicole? Tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so I'm an audiologist and professor in speech, language, and hearing sciences. And our, my research is focused on hearing loss and hearing loss interventions and addressing disparities and improving access to care for people with hearing loss living in Arizona and across the nation. And so um, my work um, is actually primarily with a program called Living Well with Hearing Loss. And I think that's where we have a lot of overlap with the Center on Compassion Studies and working with adults with hearing loss and their communication partners and families on how to maximize communication and really live well uh, with hearing loss. You know, right now during this whole pandemic, I personally am feeling the stress. Are you guys feeling some of the stress too? Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, uh, I would imagine that for many of the people you work with, the stress is particularly high because we're all wearing masks. And yeah. tell us a little bit about how people with hearing loss communicate and how important those facial expressions are to them. Yeah, so all of our brains actually use for, if we are um, use speech communication for our communication modality, we combine information from the auditory signal along with visual information. So that's for children, for people with normal hearing, for people with mild hearing loss, all the way through severe hearing loss and deafness. And there are additional considerations right now for folks who um, are deaf 
who use American Sign Language for communication as well. Um, so whether we're using um, speech communication or American Sign Language to communicate, we use a lot of visual information as we're speaking. Um, just right now, as I'm looking at myself into the Zoom camera, right, I'm smiling, so I'm conveying some emotional information along with if there's anything that you might be having trouble hearing right now, you're going to be using the visual information to help figure out which speech sound I'm saying. We don't always know that we're doing it. No. Uh, is that correct? Is that I'll be talking and then I'll give an expression and the person receiving it hears and sees both and kind of combines them in our brain? Is exactly. that how that works? Exactly. Um, yeah, it's a phenomenon called audio-visual integration. Um, and one of the reasons I really enjoy being involved in undergraduate research at the University of Arizona and um, training undergraduates in research is my own undergraduate thesis was about audio-visual integration. Um, and so we combine information. We don't even realize we're doing it because it happens very quickly. But you can, um, sometimes you can notice that in your day-to-day -day life that this is actually a phenomenon that's happening. If you've ever been bothered by a delay in an audio signal, which actually happens quite a lot during remote communication, um, sometimes when bandwidth or connectivity trouble that we're having, right, you might notice that there's a discrepancy between the audio and the visual signal, and it happens so fast, it's just on the order of milliseconds. Um, right. That's a sign that the brain is actually doing this amazing processing of combining it's, audio and visual information. It's like trying to combine the audio and visual on this Zoom call. Exactly. Leslie, uh, Leslie, when it comes to compassion, do we take those same signals, those audio visual signals, to decide whether someone is understanding me and someone is being compassionate? How important are those visual signals that we get? As Nicole was saying, the ways that we communicate with one another are not just verbal, but there's so much nonverbal communication that we express. And our faces are so expressive. Our body language is really expressive. And so that ability really to, to have that empathic resonance, um, so the ability to understand what the feelings are, of another, a lot of that really gets communicated in our facial expression. Right now, Leslie, there's, um, there's plenty of stress to go around for all of us. Do you have any tips that you might be able to give the, uh, the listener, the viewer who's watching this, a little bit of, I don't know, advice on how to handle and be more compassionate towards yourself and not just towards others? Yeah, yeah, really. Um, it's so important, I think, in this time to really recognize um, how stress is showing up for you in your body and to notice those cues to begin to um, allow them. So rather than you know uh, disconnecting from them, we have so many ways that we want to distract ourselves from what we're feeling, what we're experiencing when it's difficult. So one of the first things that we can do is just kind of notice what's happening in the body? Are we noticing tension or tightness in muscles? Um, are we noticing a sense of fatigue or is there sort of a um, extra energy or sort of an over arousal? Um, and noticing what the body's asking for in response to that. It may be movement, it may be um, some time to really allow the body to rest, it may be uh, hydrating more. Um, it can be just actually allowing a release of emotions to really let them come up to the surface and move through and remembering that we're experiencing really a, a wide range of emotions on a daily basis and to recognize the temporary nature of those how we can move through you know a really difficult or challenging phase where we're feeling a lot of anger we're feeling a lot of fear we're feeling a lot of uncertainty sadness perhaps too and let that move through and and let the body the mind really kind of resettle um, and come together and reconnect with our supports around us. I work a lot with um, folks with hearing loss who have really a lot of trouble communicating and in communities where um, English is perhaps not their first language. So along the border where people might be having challenges in terms of um, access to hearing healthcare, but also in terms of 
um, access to equal language access. Um, and some of the challenges that come up for people um, that we've been hearing about, especially with wearing the masks right now, um, is not being able to really be able to tell what another person is saying. Um, and so one of the things that really stood out to me about what you were saying was awareness being the first point and how I wonder if you could just talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, once you have that awareness, then what's a compassionate way of responding to a communication partner or of explaining to somebody that you need um, more help with communication? I think that one of the one of the really important pieces about compassion is this this really deep recognition that as human beings our desire is to um, to have a, a really strong sense of purpose and well-being and to avoid harm to avoid loss and when we're able to recognize that in ourselves and then recognize that others also share that really deep fundamental wish. It, it opens us up to this ability to sort of move beyond um, assumptions that we, that we make about each other that may or may not um, be, be accurate. And so reaching out for help and reaching out for support is actually a really, um, it's a really powerful, compassionate, action for ourselves and also I think um, for others as well because we're recognizing that we have a need. We're recognizing that we are um, interconnected, that we are interdependent with one another. You know, in our society, we are so trained to, um, to, to not be dependent on on others to kind of, you know, figure out how to do everything ourselves. And that's just really, I mean, it's really a myth, you know? And I think that the pandemic has kind of, you know, laying bare so many things. It's making a lot of things visible that I think we've, we've not necessarily seen in such clear view. So for someone who's um, feeling, you know, these, these difficulties in communication right now, that it's like another layer of stress of the pandemic, to really take time to consider, you know, what, what is it that would be helpful? What is it that, that I need? And then to be able to approach um, those that you're close to and to communicate that. So Nicole, those of us who want to be better allies um, to those who are hard of hearing, um, what are some ways that we can be proactively really supportive and, and really like better, better relatives? Yeah, so thanks. That's a great question. Um, I think I've been thinking a lot about this with the mask situation. And I think the first issue is really raising awareness around the challenges with communication that can be happening right now. I think um, we don't realize sometimes um, and just assume that someone's going to understand what we say. And so I think starting with that pause of you know, not making the assumption like you were talking about before that um, what you're communicating has been understood. And so I think um, another really important point is to ask the person. So right now we're all communicating in masks. It kind of creates this environmental change that's different for everybody. And so if we can just leverage that a little bit and say, what's different about communication right now? What works really well for you right now? Um, and ask, you know, how is my communication when it's, when you're understanding me, how is it good? Um, and relying really on other kinds of tools that we might have to um, communicate. So we might not be able to take our masks off, right? That's a terrible idea to do right now um, if we're frustrated with communication breakdowns, but figuring out other ways and making sure there's, um, for example, access to captions or writing something down, um, making sure there's ac access to interpreters, um, either for Spanish or whatever language, our American Sign Language. Um, and so I think that's really important is ask the person what they need for communication access. And then don't assume that what you're saying is going to be understood immediately. Um, Leslie, sometimes I have tried um, and I think I'm showing compassion and I think I'm showing empathy, but in reality, I'm insulting people. I'm, I'm 
I'm not using the right language to communicate. Any tips on a better way to communicate with somebody so that you don't come across as demeaning or uh, being uncompassionate? Nancy, I love that question so much. And I think one of the first things to recognize is that as human beings, you know, we're, we're going to make a lot of mistakes with each other. Um, we're hopefully learning all the time um, how to be better relatives to one another. Um, but in terms of how we can um, approach others in a more compassionate way, um, meet each other where, where we are, um, part of our, our learning process, I think part of our education process, rests on being able to get to know ourselves better too. And so learning and how to be self-compassionate can really allow us to develop a deeper sense of vulnerability to um, be vulnerable enough to, to ask um, those that, that we're with, you know, for what they need and to be more um, deeply, I think, empathic for what someone is experiencing rather than sort of making an assumption based on how we may perceive them. We're able to see them more fully as we begin to see ourselves more fully. And what I mean by that is um, as we're able to, to really allow ourselves room for all of our feelings, um, particularly the ones that are difficult to be with, um, to allow those to surface and to learn gradually um, how to not just automatically react to those difficult feelings. We all have ways that we do this in ways that are really, really subtle. When um, particular conditions get triggered for us, we react in a way, and sometimes that can create more suffering for ourselves and sometimes for others and we don't we don't mean to um, as we become more experienced in practice with self-compassion we start to um, be able to be with others in a way that we're able to see them more fully too nicole leslie is is talking a lot about um not saying the very first thing that comes to your mind <laughs> sometimes wait a little while and ask um what do you think? How do you want me to refer to you as? Would they take offense if I was to say something like, how can I better communicate with you? What, what do you need? Okay, so that's a really interesting point that you bring up about um, the stigma that exists, um, social stigma that exists related to hearing loss. And that is very present in our society, um, unfortunately. And um, I think there's a, a space there where it really comes down to the intention and the purpose of why you're asking the person if it's truly about, you know, creating equal access to communication, then, you know, that's a, that's a way of uh, talking with one another of saying, you know, how, how can I best communicate with you respectfully? And, um, make sure that it's equal access to communication. It's that usually would happen after you um, know that the person has hearing loss. The other way of doing it um, might be saying, you know, sort of self, put it on yourself rather than on the other person. Um, like um, for myself, I might say, um, I'm having trouble understanding right now. Um, can we just talk about some ways that we could all do it? And so, you, it's not, you don't have to um, necessarily out a person in that kind of way. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm thinking about right now with this um, pandemic is like everyone's having um, greater trouble communicating. And so if we could just take a more of an approach of universal design to our communication, like we start out all our Zoom calls, we have captioning available, we have um, talked about each person's going to take a turn for communicating so that one person at a time is speaking um, and that we actually do kind of slow down our rate of speech and pause a little bit more and create space for greater understanding or space for, you know, it, not stigmatizing one another about missing something in communication. I think that that would be a really positive change actually to come from the pandemic. Um, 
I don't know what you think about that, Leslie, with communication and kind of, I feel like compassion is this more universal language, really, in some way. Yes. Yes. I, I love what you're saying about this because it, to me, um, really speaks to this, this lifting up and, and celebrating and recognizing our um, unique differences Absolutely. as part of the whole. So rather than, um, you know, to sort of single out um, or stigmatize, you know, as you said, it's really this recognition of, okay, so we are, we are all in this space together and we each have, you know, different unique experiences. Um, we have unique needs and let's recognize that and just, you know, really hold all of that together when we are together. That's a learning, a deep learning process. I, right. I'm, I'm hopeful that we are in a time right now when we are collectively beginning to move more deeply into that space. But it takes, as, as you've been speaking to, you know, a lot of like individual deep willingness and work um, to do that. Is that something, uh, I hate to say positive, that's come out of the pandemic, but is that something that can help us once we're over this major hurdle if we keep utilizing some of the skills communication skills that we learned during this pandemic how important is that just to keep as nicole as you said pause a little while and let you know give it some time for other people to ask questions or break in what do you guys think I, yeah, I think so. I think that would be an amazing um, positive to come from the pandemic is if we were all um, a little bit more willing to see the importance and value of communication and the social connection between one another um, and creating spaces, you know, acknowledging everything changes, right, in ways that we can't predict and we have to adapt to. And one of the ways of adapting to that together is um, through negotiating communication effectively, right? I don't know, Leslie, if you want to add. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really echo that. I think that, you know, as difficult as this time is and as much loss um, as we are experiencing and the, the really deep um, pain that at moments feels unbearable for many um, of our relatives moving through this right now, that this, this resilience, you know, that, that Nicole is speaking to, I think is, is exactly um, the, the piece of hope, I think, that I'm carrying through this, that we are going to become more um, flexible and adaptable to how this is shaping and changing us in a way that we see each other more clearly, more fully, and with a much greater sense of compassion and care. For one another some people might say well yeah i, I kind of get that that we should but what do we actually do you know if you have someone who's having difficulties right now feeding their family they've lost their job their their whole world has kind of caved in on them um it's really hard to think those positive thoughts when there's so much darkness around you how do we do that when we're in the midst of a really painful, very difficult, very challenging situation, um, one of the really important pieces for us is to develop a sense of gentleness with ourselves, um, particularly in this time. So much of what people are experiencing, this is through conditions that are out of their control. And so to be able to, to keep that um, in awareness that the the ups and downs that we experience, you know, often we, we cannot control that. And the feelings that we experience around it are really natural. And they, um, it does not mean that we have failed in some way. It doesn't mean that we don't have deep value um, because we're experiencing this. And it's really, I think, um, even more important for those of us who are not experiencing that, that level of, um, of suffering in this time. Those of us that, that feel that we have um, 
we're either better, better resourced emotionally, um, financially, in other ways, you know, to really recognize that in this deep interconnectedness, this common humanity that we share, you know, this is, this is part of our responsibility to, um, to be able to support one another. And that sort of reciprocal um, kind of care is really, is really important right now. Leslie talked about how um, you, you have no control over the situation you're in. And I would imagine that many of the folks you work with um, may feel that too. I have no control over this. And is there anger associated with that as well? There can be, and it can relate to the circumstances through which they um, maybe acquired hearing loss either very suddenly or maybe don't have a, a reason why um, that they understand. Or, um, you know, it uh, can be felt as a loss or it can be very frustrating and angry, um, angering when someone else doesn't respond um, in a compassionate way related to hearing loss and communication access. And so it can be very difficult and um, frustrating for people, um, either the hearing loss itself or um, other people's responses to um, communication breakdowns. Nicole, one of the things that, that's really um, standing out for me that I'm appreciating mm -hmm. so much is this um, making the invisible visible in terms of um, those that are experiencing hearing loss and like bringing more visibility to, um, to, to more of us around how to be um, more supportive and really to be thoughtful, to be mindful, to be intentional about our communication not just now, but really, you know, how we, how we move forward. And um, in these days that are coming ahead and after the pandemic. So thank you so much for, for shining that light on that. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a big hope of mine, I think, right now is that, um, you know, through the pain that is this pandemic for so many of us that were experiencing um, that challenges that are so much more illuminated right now that we can realize um, that it's not just on the individual person. So it could be about a system level or, you know, um, barriers to communication or barriers to access to healthcare that are broader than any one person. And can we, as a broader community come together and figure out better ways during the pandemic and then after the pandemic. This isn't the first time anyone's, you know, ever um, noticed the challenges of communication with masks on. There have been research studies about this actually for several, well, actually going back at least a decade. Um, but it's so much more right now because it's affecting even um, more people. Um, and so I think that's, uh, a hope that I have, I guess, for the for the pandemic, um, after the pandemic as well, that we can find um, greater ways of communicating more effectively with one another. I, I, I can hear both of you talking about, and you both have used the term after the pandemic. Um, that's a hopeful thing, isn't it, Leslie? Oh, it is. <laughs> it's very, it's very <laughs> we're all going, oh, please let it be over, let it be over. But is that something that is a good thing, not such a good thing? I mean, mm. you're hoping and you're, and you're saying it with your language. You're saying after the pandemic. Is that just creating false hope for us or is that a good thing? I guess I should clarify, I think, what I, what I mean when I'm saying after the pandemic. And I'm kind of reaching back to um, my graduate education and crisis intervention, <laughs> where um, I think really what I mean is sort of after this crisis point, because we are still very much in the crisis of this mm -hmm. pandemic. And I think that there's a, there's a lot of... Um, I'm not sure if it's hope or denial, you know, in some ways in terms of it's fine, let's go back to the bars and wherever, you know, 
I think that uh, because we are still very much in the crisis of this, that people are are getting sick, that they are dying, that we are um, we are seeing many 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 um, flashpoints, you know, happening now. That it's really as we are are rebuilding, you know, as we are adapting to um, the impact of this time, you know, because we we all are. Uh, forever changed by this in ways that we can't even begin yet to imagine. But I think that it's really important that we have hope for that. Because if we don't have that, then if it's only a sense of pain and only a sense of despair, then we will fall into chaos, I think, and, and not really return. What do you think about that, Nicole? Well, that gives me some hope, I think, <laughs> too. I think, um, you know, I, one of the great things about learning about Leslie's work um, to me has been learning about compassion and learning about um, ways of coping with things that you don't expect, right? And no one expected um, this to be happening right now, right? And there's lots of things in life that happen like that. And so, um, you know, having having hopefulness um, during really dark times, um, I think is a very important thing. And communicating that with one another too, um, and supporting one another, finding ways that we can communicate and stay connected and be together, um, under circumstances that are really, really difficult and appreciating one another um, when things do go well, I think maybe is a, something that can help during the pandemic, like um, for a number of the um, different health circumstances and different experiences that um, people in my family have had recently of having to be isolated in hospitals on their own and how much we've appreciated the compassion of the healthcare providers who are really, you know, can, if they have the time, they can be going out of their way to make phone calls and communicate with people. Um, and so I have, I think gratitude, I think I was hearing from Leslie too about being a way of um, working through a really difficult time. That's something I've appreciated learning from you. Um, and finally, ladies, um, what, what do you hope the world will look like, and I'm going to say it, after the pandemic. Um, what do you hope are some lessons that we've learned, are some skills that we can hang on to? What is it that you hope the world will look like after? Yeah, one thing I hope it looks like is um, that some of these barriers and issues that have become we become great had we developed greater awareness around during the pandemic of disparities and um, you know racial inequities. I hope that our world will begin to address that at a broader level and look at um, more universal access to communication, equal access to communication, um, address disparities in healthcare. I hope that that is something that our world will do. All right, Leslie, I'll ask you that same question. Um, after the pandemic uh, has settled in whatever form it takes, what do you hope our world looks like? I really hope that we are emerging toward a time when we are um, more deeply recognizing our deep interdependence with one another that our flourishing really depends upon how we treat each other, how we see each other. I'm hopeful that this time is, is really um, a powerful reckoning and beginning of uh, dismantling these systems of oppression and, and deep inequity that this country was founded upon. 
that we, as we are all kind of um, in our own ways, uh, you know, physically um, isolated and, and have more time to, um, to see and reflect on how so many uh, members of our society that we perhaps didn't fully see or, or we took for granted um, as we realize how dependent we are on each other, that we really regain a sense of fuller seeing and that we do that in a way that we allow ourselves a way to see ourselves in a full way and to um, soften the harsh feelings of judgment that we have when things unfold that are out of our control um, that lead to painful changes and to soften the sense of judgment we feel when we make mistakes as we do as human beings. Well, thank you, ladies. I really appreciate you taking some time off, uh, except that you have a lot of time these days, don't you, at home? <laughs> uh, we've been talking with uh, Leslie Langbert, the director of the Center for Compassion Studies, and also with Nicole Moroni, an associate professor in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at the University of Arizona. I'm Nancy Montoya. We'll be back next time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Nicole.